this is our life with bees, and this is our life without bees. Bees are the most important pollinators of our fruits and vegetables and flowers and crops like alfalfa hay that feed our farm animals. More than one third of the world's crop production is dependent on bee pollination. But the ironic thing is that bees are not out there pollinating our food intentionally. They're out there because they need to eat. Bees get all of the protein they need in their diet from pollen, and all of the carbohydrates they need from nectar. They're flower feeders, and as they move from flower to flower, basically on a shopping trip at the local floral mart, they end up providing this valuable pollination service. In parts of the world where there are no bees, or where they plant varieties that are not attractive to bees, people are paid to do the business of pollination by hand. These people are moving pollen from flower to flower with a paintbrush. Now, this business of hand pollination is actually not that uncommon. Tomato growers often pollinate their tomato flowers with a handheld vibrator. Now, this is this one's the tomato tickler. Now, <laughs> this is this is because <laughs> the pollen within a tomato flower is held very securely within the male part of the flower, the anther, and the only way to release this pollen is to vibrate it. So, bumblebees. Are one of the few kinds of bees in the world that are able to hold on to the flower and vibrate it, and they do this by shaking their flight muscles at a frequency similar to the musical note C. So they vibrate the flower, they sonicate it, and that releases the pollen in this efficient swoosh, and the pollen gathers all over the fuzzy bee's body, and she takes it home as food. Tomato growers now put bumblebee colonies inside the greenhouse to pollinate the tomatoes because they get much more efficient pollination when it's done naturally, and they get better quality tomatoes. So there's other, maybe more personal reasons to care about bees. There's over 20,000 species of bees in the world, and they're absolutely gorgeous. These bees spend the majority of their life cycle hidden in the ground or within a hollow stem, and very few of these beautiful species have evolved highly social behavior, like honeybees. Now, honeybees tend to be the charismatic representative for the other 19,900 plus species, because there's something about honeybees that draws people into their world. Humans have been drawn to honeybees since early recorded history, mostly to harvest their honey, which is an amazing natural sweetener. I got drawn into the honeybee world completely by a fluke. I was 18 years old and bored, and I picked up a book at the library on bees, and I spent the night reading it. I had never thought about insects living in complex societies. It was like the best of science fiction come true, and even stranger. There were these people, these beekeepers, that loved their bees like they were family. And when I put down the book, I knew I had to see this for myself. So I went to work for a commercial beekeeper, a family that owned 2,000 hives of bees in New Mexico, and I was permanently hooked. Honeybees can be considered a superorganism, where the colony is the organism, and it's comprised of 40 to 50,000 individual bee organisms. Now this society has no central authority; nobody's in charge. So how they come to collective decisions and how they allocate their tasks and divide their labor, how they communicate where the flowers are—all of their collective social behaviors are mind-blowing. My personal favorite, one that I've studied for many years, is their system of healthcare. So bees have social healthcare. <laughs> So in my lab, we study how bees keep themselves healthy. For example, we study hygiene, where some bees are able to locate and weed out sick individuals from the nest, from the colony, and keeps the colony healthy. And more recently, we've been studying resins that bees collect from plants. So bees fly to some plants and they 